I'm Noelle Silver. I guess I've been in uh, enterprise tech my whole career. But yeah, I, I went to IBM and then to Red Hat and then VMware. All at kind of interesting times in technical history when we were trying to do something new every time I went to a new company. And most recently I went to Alexa when, um, or Amazon when Alexa was the new thing. And I got to really start something that we would never done in the industry before. And that kind of took my whole career in a new tangent, which we'll probably talk about as well. I then went to Microsoft and learned about democratizing AI and got very passionate across both those companies about ethics and responsible use of AI. Uh, misinformation, deep fake technology, mindful leadership of engineering teams, and then just how do we change the DNA of our engineering teams in general. And so that's kind of what I do today is I talk a lot about that. I do have two engineering teams that I currently run now. Um, and I was super intentional and purposeful about creating kind of a symphony of people um, that I have now the pleasure to work with. And you don't every day get to build a team, um, but when you do, like I'm super proud of the work that I just finished doing and building the team at HackerU. So, so hopefully I can talk a little bit, um, maybe tonight about some of the, the challenges in doing that, but also just some of the fun things I've gotten to do in my career. The first thing we wanted to ask is what inspired you initially to pursue STEM and how did your interest in tech lead you to pursue business and management consulting? Absolutely. So I suppose my, my interest in tech started at a very young age when my dad introduced, I mean, he's a sci-fi buff, I guess you'd call him. Almost all the movies, I, I think my first movie ever um, was Star Wars. And so that, I feel like that kind of set the trajectory for my life, yeah. <laughs> even, even if ever so subtly, uh, but my dad was always speaking technology into my life, but not from a like, you should be a tech person or you should go into tech, but just that, you know, now we call, I kind of call it ambient computing. We talked about tech like it was just part of life. What is your favorite thing about tech and AI? Oh goodness, do I have to pick just one? Um, let's see. So I, huh. I guess my favorite thing about tech is that for someone like me who constantly likes to learn new things, and I think actually as a human race, we have this wonderful chemical in our brain, dopamine, and it drives us to learn and we get we get this really great high when we're acquiring new knowledge. It's why we are so excited to go when we hear someone's posted new content. When Alexa was born, no one knew what that would be. Um, and so because I had this kind of practice of just jumping into the unknown, which very much is the sci-fi of the 50s, <laughs> Um, but jumping into the unknown and then just immersing myself in the technology, uh, I really feel like has has helped me. Um, and now I look for it. Like it's the best best part about my job, any job I have, is that I know that there's a new cool opportunity on the horizon that I could take advantage of. These windows of these opportunities, though it seems like, wow, Alexa, wh how lucky you are. I mean, there's always going to be an Alexa of sorts that you can dive into. It's just being willing to really go all in. Um, but that I think is part of the fun. What does a typical day in your life look like now during these times? I have two engineering teams that I work with to create curriculum programs at HackerU for universities nationwide. I wake up very early around 4.30, 5 o'clock. Then I work a full day, mostly in Zoom meetings. Um, I then, you know, somewhere in there, try to do a load of laundry and clean my dishes. <laughs> And then I start dinner around 5.30, then I put the kids to bed. And then remember, I woke up at 4.30, so around 10, I'm like ready to go to bed. My job right now, uh, as I mentioned, I'm building university education and I picked this job. So that's one thing is that I encourage people who are looking at opportunity to not presuppose that there's a certain path or a certain type of job that they can get. Um, a lot of us tend to, especially women, women of color, we, men of color, tend to be like, well, I could probably get an entry level position. And then we go just for that, as opposed to potentially looking at the job description and be like, wow, I'm pretty close on, on a mid-level. Well, I was yeah. wondering what struggles you have faced as a woman in these two industries and in your career in general. Yes, yeah, so I will start like with my very first job because it's more pro probably closely aligned to those who are maybe watching. It, when I was, I mean, I didn't actually finish college. I got very close and I just got impatient as I am. I now know myself to be ADHD, but I didn't know that back then. But I was just like, I just didn't see a point of it. So I just quit and went and took a job at IBM delivering Java training. Um, and I was good at it, so it all worked out. I then um, get in front of a classroom uh, where I'm teaching Java and I only just learned Java like the year before. Oh, and I learned it in Barnes & Noble. Right, so I went to Barnes and Noble, got books off the shelf, did the labs, got the job because I knew it, right? It's, it's still the same knowledge, but now I'm standing in front of a room of COBOL programmers or standing in front of a room of small talk engineers that want to transition to Java, and none of them look like me. They're all older than me by maybe 15, 20 years, and they're all white and they're all male, like all of them. And so that alone is not terrible. Like I could walk into a room like that today. I do all the time. Unfortunately, we still have kind of a 
homogeneous industry in tech. But what bothered me was, is that when I did get up to speak, I was instantly kind of, I don't know, systemically presumed not to know what I was talking about. So the first 30 minutes of every class when I first started would be this barrage of questions, just trying to figure out like, how much do you know? And can you even teach me anything? And trying to discredit me in front of the classroom. And it was really hard. I remember running to the bathroom and crying and being like, why would I do this? This is terrible. <laughs> um, and I remember in that moment thinking to myself, no, like we are not crying at work. We're, you know, some of us have had this moment where something happens and we're like, this is not, no, no I'm not being down like this. Um, so I went back. But that day, it shifted how I do everything. Because from that day on, I never went to class without being not just a, a, a chapter ahead, not just a book ahead, but like I would know with the entire course, backwards and forwards, I ended up knowing every single error code a piece of software could have. There were thousands of them, and I knew them all by heart. But I did that because I never wanted some white person to be able to stand at me and go, well, do you know this one? And, I, and I'd be like, I don't, but that doesn't mean I don't know what I'm saying. But I then, I had to take on that burden and I've now, since telling this story, I found out lots of us do this. Lots of us find us in a position where we maybe feel unfairly like barraged about like, if you're a woman in tech, they'll be like, I mean, if you're a front end dev even, it doesn't matter what color or gender you are. If you're a front end dev, people are like, well, that's not really software engineering, it's just front end. And you're like instantly on the defensive. So what do you do? Some of us go learn back end dev just because. I guess knowing this and having this mindset, what would be your advice to an aspiring female tech entrepreneur? Yes, my biggest advice um, is to identify what you want. Um, and then <laughs> be willing to like, when I say what you want, I don't necessarily mean like the car, the house, even the baby. Is success having a child and raising a family? Is success having a socioeconomic impact in the world? Is success building a technology that will change the planet? Is success, you know, what is it? Mentoring. When I first started my career, I branded myself as the companies I worked for. And I did great for them. Like I built brands that even today are recognized um, for them. But I never attached my name to it. I disappeared. I in, like, like a blanket, wrapped myself in their brand. And that's not a terrible thing, but you have the opportunity today to do both. I have my personal brand that I can wrap myself up in. That's the blanket I want to wrap myself up in, right? Who am I? What are my values? What are the projects that I'm interested in? And that way I can attract people, companies, funders, investors to me that openly, transparently see what I'm all about. It's really cool to see how your perspective changed and how, you know, things have fluctuated over your career and, you know, your time. Um, and I guess this brings me kind of like to our very last question, which you touched on at the beginning. I'm very excited for this question. Um, it's a fun one. Um, but at the beginning, you mentioned that you had a TikTok platform and that, you know, this window opened up for you. Um, so do you mind sharing with us a little bit more about that platform, what you do through it? A content platform, there's only two platforms today that I get the most engagement. And one is LinkedIn and the other, surprisingly, is now TikTok. <laughs> um, but to an incredible degree. So I started off um, I went to TikTok, someone I knew was a content producer and was like, you should build for this platform. Uh, because Tech Talk, which is the technical area of TikTok, the tech community, I was like, oh, I didn't even know this. And there's a bunch of coders, but there weren't a ton of women. Um, and so I got, I started doing just series. I went and started looking at people who were popular um, and modeling them. And one of my favorites was Astronaut Kelly, where she is an astronaut at NASA. And she was doing these super fun, but very like, women in STEM focused content. And so I started modeling what she was doing, modeling what some other people were doing. And I literally did cut, I duetted them, did the same exact things that they did. But then what happens is once you build this muscle memory, then you start getting your own ideas, which are combinations of what people have done. And I stumbled upon deep fakes, especially right before the election um, and realized people just don't understand tech. <laughs> and so one of the things I got passionate about was like, you should at least know what this is. Um, and you should know what it look what it looks like. If you were gonna go to TikTok and try and build a brand, 15 seconds was my magic number. I started doing one minute videos about AI and I got my friends, 300 people loved it. But when I started to get over a thousand, 2000, 4000, 6000 um, followers, 15 seconds was the magic mark. So anything less than 15 seconds did like exponentially better than things that, that were longer than a minute. It's a harder to think about how to be impactful in 15 seconds, but I actually love it. Um, you know, it's like the, human way where like we have attention spans of goldfish or worse <laughs> so 15 seconds is a is an awesome thing to start with and it's not intimidating awesome